Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the General Questions series, and it is a question and answer session from people in Kentucky, presented by Jesus and Mary Magdalene on the 31st of August 2013 in Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia. This is part one. Good. How's everyone? Good? Yeah? Is there any I haven't met before here today? A few you haven't seen for a while? Welcome back for those I haven't seen for a while. Um, what we're going to do today basically is just have question and answers today. For anyone who wants to ask any questions, I'm happy to try to give you some answers. <laughs> and uh, that's basically all we're going to do. We'll probably go until around probably 5, 5.30. Um, but there is a bit of a spread up the back, I notice. So you guys, that probably means you guys want to have a break in an hour or two, is that right? To eat that up. And uh, so we'll probably have a break after an hour or two. Um, there's going to be, there are, there are going to be recordings of this. Is it all running? Yep. yep. Do you want me to clap? Yep. Do you want to just to synchronise this sound? Are you happy there, Igor, or do you, do you want people to come up and ask their questions? Happy You're happy as Larry? <laughs> <laughs> is Larry happy? <laughs> That's the saying. That's the saying. <laughs> Igor's caught up with all these Australian sayings. With filming us all the time. But he doesn't know what half of them mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's the way it goes. Boy, it feels a bit strange. It's strange, isn't um, it? Yep. I'm just wondering if there's spare seats, whether we just have a normal, some normal seats. Oh, it is comfy. Oh, it is comfortable. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Yeah, um, I suppose, do you want to know anything about what's happened over the last... <laughs> few months before we uh, uh, go into questions and answers. Yeah? Um, when was the last time we caught up with you as a group? Probably some time ago. Summerfest. November. November, yeah. So uh, a year, uh, nearly, nearly... Ten months. Ten months. Ten months, yeah. So since then we've been pretty busy actually. Um, because even though we, haven't, we didn't do any seminars or anything for the first five or six months of that time, but what happened was we uh, started off doing a heap of frequently asked question material, and we're so far, I think we're up to around 300 or so at this point, uh, doing those, so 300 different questions, and we've been placing these, these on YouTube so that people can have one question, one answer, one question, one answer type of thing, and the, then they don't have to watch like hours and hours and hours of videos to get an answer to a specific question. And we're hoping, in fact, that we will eventually get thousands of those done. And uh, we're just plugging our way through a lot of questions that people have asked over the years. And we're slowly making up a library of questions and answers like that. We're also trying to cover some pretty material that the average people who have been listening in the last four or five years probably haven't heard before um, in those F FAQs because what we found was I, I had answered a lot of questions before I met people or before we recorded um, and then I never have gotten to ask, answer those same questions again for some time. So, so what we've done is put a lot of material on the Frequently Asked Questions channel that most people probably haven't heard before. At so the, that's good. Yeah. Mm. At the moment we're filming on relationship with a partner. Lots of Frequently Asked Questions about that. Mm. I think a lot of people would be excited about that. Mm. And we're also filming Qualities of Divine Truth, which is a really awesome topic as well. So mm. along with all of the general, are you saying you're Jesus? Are you saying you're Mary Magdalene? There's a lot of... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the next part of the story where we went to England and answered that question like about 17 times. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm a bit over those questions. So very, I'm we're very <laughs> over those questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, what we thought too was with the FAQ channel that eventually we don't have to answer the same question twice anymore. <laughs> so it's a hope. Part, that's a hope anyway. <laughs> So that, that's partly why we've done it as well. And because it's easier, um, it's just easier 
in terms of managing truth with people if they want to ask one question and get one answer and that's all they're interested in hearing. So those are all going okay. It's a lot of editing work from Lena and Igor's perspective uh, because every single question has a front end plate on it, an end plate on it, and an end plate on it, and it has um, a summary, uh, if you like. And uh, because we do 20 or so of them in a session, they have to cut up each video into those, and so it takes some time to edit. So we're getting a bit of a backlog of questions that we are producing, so that's really good, actually, because we're hoping to get thousands of them prepared and out before before we feel there'll be some larger growth of the desire for truth on the planet. So we're hoping to get a lot of this material prepared over the next year in particular because it's very, very hard to help a lot of people all at once without having a library of questions that have been answered. So that's why we're doing that. Then we did do a seminar just before we went away to the UK in uh, Mergen which was all about faith and prayer. So there was a series, I don't know if you've seen them, downloaded them on the net, about faith and prayer. And we've done a series of discussions about the Paget messages, about similar sub subjects, faith and prayer and so forth. And what we're trying to do now is actually discuss things in groups. So if there's a certain topic we want to cover, we're trying to cover that topic with a seminar, but also with an inter a sort of a discussion between myself and Mary that's recorded, and also with frequently asked questions about that particular subject and so forth, so that there's a whole library of information being prepared. We're also trying to get some books written. Um, that's a slow process at the moment because we haven't had a huge amount of time. And then we had a rush trip to the UK. Uh, the, one of the, the television stations in the UK paid for us to go. And uh, they paid for us to go to do a seven-minute interview. Um, and they asked us, are you saying you <laughs> <laughs> The same question. Yeah. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, interesting that was over there. Just we, we got to also meet up with, did some radio interviews. I think we've done probably 20 or so of them over the last few months as well. And in addition to a lot of... Uh, we're doing some documentary type of stuff as well. We're, we had a UK documentary uh, team leader and his, his cameraman come and stay with us for... We didn't stay with us. They came and filmed us for five or seven, eight days straight and a day over in the UK as well. And that will probably be coming out in the BBC over in the coming three months or so. Uh, it will be a one-hour documentary probably on the BBC. We've got no idea what it's going to turn out like, of course, <laughs> and what he's going to put in it. So, But, uh, but we decided to engage that just to uh, more to, to deal with a few of our own emotions more than anything else about those kind of things. So that uh, was pretty busy like July and August as a result of that. So, um, And now we're almost at the beginning of September, but um, we'll be going in October across to the USA. There's a group of people over there that have paid for us to go over there. And we'll be visiting three locations in the USA, um, Philadelphia, San Diego and Texas. And for the very first time, we're having 10 days where we stay with a group of people in Texas. So that'll be interesting. I think it'll be more interesting for them than us. <laughs> If we're anyone's not. actually spent more than like 24 hours straight with us ever, you know that it can get a bit uh, It gets a bit hard saturated. emotionally, yeah. <laughs> shall we say. <laughs> and most of them are not used to that. Uh, most of them have only ever spent um, probably a seminar or something like that in our company. So it's going to be interesting time to see what happens there. Um, so, yeah, we're, so, but we're looking forward to that. We'll be there in October and November and then back home, back home to... Queensland, hopefully. So that's our life for the last few months. Just busy running around, pretty much. <laughs> and uh, it's been pretty dry down here, hasn't it? Yeah, It's been pretty dry where we are too. And so I'm sure you're looking forward to some rain, just like we are. 
And um, as a result of that, all of the experiments that I've got going on in my property are all working well. So um, all the experiments of all the big, big pits and all of those kind of things that we did. And uh, for the first time, we've had insect life all the way through winter, pretty much, and lots of bird life and a lot more birds breeding and stuff like that for the first time. In our, on our property, but because we've been away a fair bit still, we don't get to do much at home aside from go home, which is basically go home, wash, iron, <laughs> <laughs> pack ready for the next trip, <laughs> go again, in amongst the different uh, projects that we have on. So that's what we've been doing. How have you been? Up and down? Yeah. How are you finding the, the pathway to God? Riddled with rocks and... <laughs> is it? <laughs> Falling rocks. Falling rocks. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it, how when we first hear divine truth, because a lot of it's external in its nature, it feels really good to know, doesn't it? But then when you start getting into your own personal life and your own personal problems and changing life, your soul your personally, then it becomes very difficult for the majority of people because we are so invested in our addictions. A lot of the times we are complete denial of any that we have any addiction when we begin. Mm -hmm. And so it's the, the difficult part is the personal part, isn't it? Have you found that? Like accepting universal truth is relatively easy in comparison to accepting the truth about yourself and actually working your way through that emotionally. Yeah. So what we'd like to do today is give you the opportunity to ask questions about that um, so we can help you a bit with those kind of issues. And we've got the board if we need it for uh, just doing a few diagrams and things like that for you. So you want to proceed? Or do you want to go home now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, who would like to go first? Catherine. So, Catherine, you want to go first? If the mic's coming down. Oh. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Up, not down. Are we right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, about eight weeks ago, mm -hmm. I went to see a man who says he's a chiropractor mm -hmm. um, and um, he lives in uh, Tenderfield. Mm -hmm. um, since then, I've been in a great deal of pain. Physical pain? Pardon? Physical pain? Physical pain, yep. yes. Um, I did... Um, I, did, I do have a lot of coughing, but mm. it's stopping. Um, about a week ago, I stopped vomiting and my temperature went down. I used to get a temperature about four o'clock every afternoon. Right. Yep. Um, and it's all... Um, he said it's all muscles and tendons. It's not joints and things like that. Yeah. And so muscles and tendons, I believe, is resistance... Um, I've also had, because I can't walk properly or lift my feet properly, I've had two falls. Yeah. Both of them have been on my left side yeah. and both of them have uh, hurt the left knee more. I kind of feel that that's more self-punishment yep. um, than anything else. Um, I know um, by the time that I started uh, primary school... Um, I was so rigid at that time, I, I couldn't touch my toes or anything like that. So I'm presuming that it's... So you've had a lack of flexibility in your body all, all, the, my life. all your life, pretty well, much. Well, yes. <clears throat> well, since I can remember anyway. Yeah. And I imagine that is all coming from um, um, the projections I got from my parents um, and the blame... Well, the hatred, actually. Yeah. Um, that you my received mother, a lot of hatred from your parents. From my mother, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, well, my father died when I was three and a half. Yeah, so. from mum in particular. So. Yes, mm. yes. Um, hatred and blame and jealousy and mm -hmm. um, 
and blame, you know, I was blamed for everything. I was blamed for the rape. I, I was blamed for my father's death. I was blamed because there wasn't any money. And they were the big things, you know, but I was blamed for all the small things as well. Yeah. And I just wonder if... Um, you know, a lot of stuff has been coming up. You know, I've, I've <laughs> crying quite a bit about the pain, but I've been just sitting on the bed and quite often just rocking backwards and forwards, a little bit like a child with some yeah, yeah. Aut- autism. Yeah. Um, there's been. Um, did, did you know? Have you noticed that when you cry with the pain, has the pain gone away, or is it? It seems it to get a little bit better for a, a short for a while. Short period. And there's, um, I've been screaming, I've been making funny noises, a lot of guttural, yep. guttural sort of noises coming up. Yep. Um, and they're all things I don't, they just happen, you know. Yeah. And yesterday I just kind of started whimpering and carrying on and that went into um, um, crying and, um, and there's also been... Um, Quite a bit of fear. There's been the hot flushes with the shame. You yeah. know, I mean, there's just been all of this sort of stuff. But it's, mm. been but go- it's pretty intense. Yeah, it's and been it's been going intense. on for two months. Two months, yeah. Since you saw him, basically. Yes, and I think that he actually released all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, and, and so he's triggered some parts he's, of the body that have let, yes. started letting go yes. of things. Yeah. Yes, I, I, well, I don't know whether it's letting it go. I seem to be resisting it. <laughs> Um, Yes. So the questions, can I summarise your questions for you or do you want to summarise? No, no, (laughs) no. No, you can say whatever you like. Okay. Um, So one of the questions is about the pain, isn't it? Like why is there so much pain? Mm. That's one of the questions. Another question is that you are concerned about how long this is going on yes. and what's happening with it in terms of what's going to happen. Basically, I've done nothing for two months. Yeah. I've done the basics around the house and that's yeah. it. You've managed to, because you've lived by yourself, you've yes. managed to obviously eat occasionally still <laughs> to have yes. something to throw I've up. I've lost about five kilos. Yes. Mm. Um, but uh, you've had some what I feel... Uh, what, what I'd classify as decent emotional releases about some things and other things you've been in a bit of resistance to. Yes. But um, So if I can basically explain to you what's been happening. The first thing, though, that I'd like to say is the majority of people that start going through this kind of process become very concerned very quickly. Right? We're not used to having these kind of processes in our day-to-day life, and so what we have a tendency to do is we have a tendency to judge the process, and as a result of judging the process, we have a tendency to not allow it to occur for very long. So the average person, you know, wouldn't normally allow something like that to occur for for a couple of hours, let alone a few days or a week, and certainly not two months. You know, they'd be really worried about two months. I've been through processes like that that have lasted up to four years, so... um, I don't have any concern or judgment about those kind of processes. Does that make sense? Yes. And I've also had a lot of physical pain that in my body that I've had to release over that period of time. Now, if we can first focus on two things that we can do right at the beginning with regard to these kind of things that go on. Eventually, when we make the breakthrough from all of the denial and we start allowing the process to begin this is the kind of experience we'll have. It will be quite intense. So there'll be quite intense releases of fear, there'll be quite intense uh, pain in the body and so forth. And I'll explain why that's the case in a minute. But, But what we have a tendency to do at that beginning point is that we don't trust God through the process. So what we do is we start to go into a bit of a panic about the process. And when we go into a panic, we actually add to the pain of the process. Does that make sense? Yes. So the fear of the emotion and the fear of the pain causes the pain and the emotional pain to intensify rather than to release. And one of the reasons why we do that is because we don't really trust God. We don't really trust that God's got us in his arms helping us go through a process that we need to go through. If you could, uh, and I have likened this before 
to a process of pulling out splinters, if you like, that are in, inside of your body. And, you know, a person can fight the process of somebody taking out a splinter and it's going to be a pretty traumatic process. And if you imagine it as a spear rather than a splinter, because mm -hmm. uh, that's what a, a lot of our emotional and, and soul-based issues are like. They're like a great big solid chunk of spear in our body from an emotional perspective. Where, and we've had these problems often for all of our life or the majority of our life. And it's the problems associated with the first seven years of our life that are generally the most painful. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, all of these um, are pains that we've uh, developed and then denied. In the process of denial, we've lived a sort of a state of numbness. And we've lived a state of physical numbness as well. Physical, physically, we've detuned from the pains of our own body. And emotionally, we've detuned from the pains of our emotions. And so we go through life almost like a, what would you call it, sort of like... We're just taking on generally the roles that have been defined to us during our childhood. And then we're basically living a role-based life, almost like an automation robot, living a role-based life for the rest of our life. And that normally is how the average person lives all of their life and then dies. And they die generally from the suppression of the physical and emotional illnesses that they've suppressed during that period of time. And that causes their death in the end. So they die and they, everyone thinks it's normal. They pass into the spirit world and they are still generally in a state of emotional numbness, uh, even after passing. Now, they at some point and we at some point, if we really want to progress in our life, we need to do it differently. We need to take, take action to do something differently to that. And so what, what we're encouraging is doing this now, of course, which is the process you've begun. Now, with this, with this man that started, and basically what I would classify him doing with you is body work. He's basically triggering the muscular system of your body. Most of our emotions are actually do have a physical connection to certain parts of our body. So every part of our body that um, is currently... Con is currently con Pardon me. connected to an emotion, usually emotion we've suppressed. And remember, most of these emotions we've suppressed all of our life. Now, I don't know if many of you have tried to hold a position, like with a weight, hold a position for as long as possible in that one place. Like if you pick up a weight, you know, you pick up something's heavy, and even it doesn't have to be too heavy, and you just hold it in a certain position that's uncomfortable, and then try holding it there for a minute and two minutes and three minutes, and five minutes, and ten minutes. Now, if you ever get to an hour, which most people actually don't, what starts happening? All this lactic acid builds up in your body, all the muscular system in your body starts to... And you start even using your mind to detune from the pain. And in fact, you can almost completely detune from the pain that your body is obviously feeling. But, but when you take the weight away and then try to move that arm... What's it like? That's when you feel the extreme pain. You, do you understand? And your soul's a bit like that as well. All of your life, you've been in denial of specific emotional pressures, emotional pain, and that have a relationship to all of the physical pains in your body, and you've been in denial of them, holding on to them. And denial can be right from denial through to having your addictions met with them or avoid, and, and avoiding your fears, of course. So all of that... Denial is like a build-up of pain over life, over your life. Now, by the time we hit half a century old, that's a lot of pain that's now built up over a long period of time that we've been completely desensitised to. Now, when we start doing body therapy of some kind, like some kind of body work, the majority of times it circumnavigates the mind. It... it it stops the mind from interfering with the, what's going on in the body. So in other words, if, if the average person thinks about their emotions, they will generally not get into their emotions because they've used their mind for the majority of their life to deny their emotions. And so their mind has become a tool of the soul-based desire to deny. So everything you do in your mind generally at that point 
So the, and this happens very usually by the time we're seven years of age, it's well established. And then we continue that process right the way through, generally, through the rest of our life. But in this process of denial, there's a build-up of all this emotion and also a relationship with the build-up of all the pain, physical pain in your body as well. So now you've got two things building up, building up, building up, building up. Now normally we try harder to suppress them. So we, so we suppress the pain through medication, through taking pills and you know, using medical techniques to suppress the pain. And the emotional pain, we also have a tendency to suppress that using different techniques, including avoidance completely, or we use techniques, again, reliant on the medical profession, like things like taking antidepressants or some other kind of medication to avoid the emotional pain and so forth. And these particular two things usually happen at the same time. We're trying to do both things at the same time. Because if we allow the physical pain to expose, it will also start triggering the emotional pain. Or if, and if we allow the emotional pain to expo be exposed, it will start affecting the physical pain. So what we do is we suppress both. That's the only way we manage. We think it's managing, I should say. Because it's not actually managing anything, if you think about it. It's, going to, it's building up, building up, building up this emotional pain until such a point that at some point in the future there is going to be some kind of a breakdown, either of the physical body or the emotional self there's going to be a breakdown of one of those two things. And the extreme breakdown of that is death, yes. uh, the cause of our own death. Now, that's what we normally do. What this man has done is started to trigger a process where your mind can no longer be involved in the process of what's going on at the soul. And by pressuring certain points in the body, there's a, there's a, and your allowance, you're allowing the release of it. Now, in the process of allowing the release, sometimes you get into resistance. During those times, you're going to have more pain. So your pain will intensify at the times when you're going to have resistance. But when you release the resistance, the pain will lessen as well. And in fact, you'll get to the point where you won't have any more physical pain because you know that if you allow the emotional pain straight away, the physical pain won't even be present anymore. So you get to that point. But you're not yet at that point. No, it would no. be nice. No. <laughs> but when you think about it, two months... Ha and how old are you now, Catherine? Um, 68. So you're 68. So in, for two months you've only been doing this process, basically. And this, by the way, is the real process. All of the talking about the process that has happened up till now was just talking about it. This is the actual real process. This is, the pro this is what it's like where you can't avoid it any single day. You just can't avoid what's going on. You can't avoid processing through it emotionally. You can't avoid the physical pain of it. You can't avoid any of these things. That's the real process that we're talking about to people, about emotional processing. That's what we mean by emotional processing. So all these conceptualised ideas about emotional processing that most people have, you know, that they think that they can just have a thought and work a way through something and then have a little cry for five minutes, that's not emotional processing. Emotional processing is what you're doing now. Well, at least that's something. That's something, right? <laughs> so, so you're ahead of most of us in that regard because most of us aren't even doing that, right? But the key now is to understand what's going on inside of yourself. Every time you resist an emotion or you resist a pain which, remember, is always caused by an emotion, there will be more pain. Every time you allow the pain or soften to the pain, there will be less pain. And that's the way you learn, after a while, how you can manage all the pain in, in your entire body by just allowing the emotion that the pain triggers. So it is rare now for me to have pain in my body. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. In comparison to the pain I had in my body like eight, nine years ago. It was very, very intense pain all the time in my body. Now it's very rare. But I've had to go through this process. Right. Right? And I've had to trust God that the process is not infinite. In other words, I'm not an infinite being. And since I'm not an infinite being, the emotion that's stored in me cannot be infinite. So therefore, if I release it, at some point, it's all got to go. <laughs> yes. It's not going to go on forever. 
Now, many people start the process and after it's been going for a couple of months, they start getting worried that it's going to go on forever. But when you think about it... That's what it feels like. That's what it feels like. But two months in 68 years, if you work that out as a percentage, that's not a very high percentage of emotional processing when you think about it, is it? No, it's not. So I've probably got another 10 years to go. (laughs) (laughs) Not of the intensity that you're facing, no. If you keep allowing this process to go on, I'd be surprised if it lasted another year or even another six months. Um, It just depends on what you allow as to how long it will last. Obviously, if you tip out a bottle of water slowly, then it's going to take longer to empty. If you tip it out quite rapidly and you're able to cope with that and you're, you're, you're trusting God through that process, then it'll happen very, very rapidly generally. And so it won't take years and years. It will take months and months, but not years and years. We can't expect it to take no time at all. We can't expect instant change. Whenever there is an instant change, then we should automatically be suspicious. Right. Because no instant change can occur in the soul. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. The only instant changes that can occur is getting overcloaked by a spirit. <laughs> And they then impose a certain emotion upon you. So that, then there's instant changes. So that's what I'm saying. We need to be co- careful of instant changes. Instant changes are usually the results of spirit interference in this process. Most other changes, soul-based real changes, are going to occur over a period of time. But how fast that time is will depend on our allowance of what goes on during that period. So what you're experiencing is a heap of emotional release at different times of the day in particular. You're experiencing quite a lot of physical pain which you're having to allow yourself to soften to and feel. And sometimes you get into resistance about that. Yes. Yeah. And therefore the pain intensifies or the interference with spirits intensifies during those times. And that's a feedback system telling you that's not the way to go. The best thing to do is to soften to the process. Yes, right. Well, that's, that's probably good because I think the pain in the last few days has been getting worse. So yeah. presumably I've been resisting it more. Exactly. Now, where the pain is will tell you what you're resisting to a large degree. So where is your pain? <coughs> well, it's basically all over my body, but um, it's more um, f- starting from the lumbar vertebra. Mm-hmm. Um, down, down, or down the legs. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, but there's also. Can I tell you what that's all about? Not moving pain? forward. Sorry. No, <laughs> it's not about not moving forward. It's about, you see, from a very young age, your sense of worth has been has been attacked, not just suppressed, but attacked overtly by and by in particular your mother, right? Yes. And you've also had this other problem because it's been attacked by your mother, you often have been attacked in the past by spirits as well during your sleep state, which causes you to not get much rest. In other words, yes. you're always trying to wake up because you don't like what's happening in, when you're asleep. Yes. And as a result, you don't get much physical rest either. Does that make sense? That's right. Now, all of this is occurring because of... Uh, the pain of this is occurring because of the feeling inside of you that you're not going to cope with how bad you feel about yourself. Yes. Sense? So it's about your self-worth. Yes. Right? And, and that's why it's starting at, at the small of your back, right down the bottom mm-hmm. of your back there. It's, because it's all about your worth and how you see your worth. And, and much of your emotional pain relates to your worth. Does that make sense? Yes. And so this is the emotion, the grief that you're in denial of or trying to remain in denial of at times, right? Is how bad you feel about yourself. Yes. And you haven't wanted to, up until recently, you haven't wanted to even face it, let alone feel it. So you haven't even wanted to acknowledge it was there, let alone feel it. You've been aware that there's been issues. You've withdrawn from society a lot in your life. Yes. You've stayed away from people a lot in your life. And these are all the results of you trying to avoid this emotion of how bad you feel about yourself when you're with people. Does that make sense? Yes, that's right. Yeah. 
And that grief that, that is right there now, that's the grief you need to let yourself feel if you want the pain to reduce. When you suppress this grief, the pain in your body will intensify. Yes. Does that make yes. sense? Mm, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And so unless you allow that grief to come and surface and allow yourself to process through it, you'll find this lower back pain uh, and the pain in other parts of your body, the muscular parts of your body, will increase until you allow it to, to yourself to experience. Now understand that this is not a, like, this is not you going, getting worse. <laughs> Do you understand? Yes. This is actually you, you've gone from the point of denying every pain and in the last year that I've known you, you've gone from the point of deni the last few years I've known you, you've gone from the denial of all of your pain into the acceptance that you have pain. Yes. And the acceptance you have some emotional issues or injuries into an awareness of those emotional issues and injuries and an awareness of the pain and then even a desire when you went and saw this man, a desire to actually start addressing it from a, at, a, at a physical and an emotional level. Yes. So this is quite good progress, Catherine. <laughs> Does that make sense? You well, get, yes, I'm, I'm pleased you're telling me this because I was getting in a bit of despair. Yeah, this is good progress. And, and there is more progress to make uh, in regard to it. But think about it this way. You've so far spent two months of this really hard process in 68 years. Yes. So what's that in terms of a percentage? Mm. Very little. Right, it's probably, it's probably about one, you know, one fifth of a percent or something like that of, in, terms of, uh, in terms of time, if you like. Yes. Now, even if it takes you one year, you've only spent 2% of your life working your way through an issue that for 99% of your life or 98% of your life you denied. Mm, and restricted my life. Yeah. Completely, yes. And that's not a bad percentage when you think about it. <laughs> Does that make sense? Of course, yes. Yeah. But you see, when we're going through it, we don't think of it that way. No. When we're going through it, it feels like a nightmare. And when we're going through it, we think that there's something major wrong. But the reality is, the thing that's been major wrong was the 68 years of suppression. Yes. That's the major wrong. That's where all the harm was done. And now you're in a process of undoing that harm. Does that make sense? Yes. But it will be painful because you've denied the pain for that so period long. of time. And it's like holding on to that thing and holding it there, denying the pain of it. And then all of a sudden you realise you're holding it. You take the thing out of your arm and then you try to let go of your arm. And now there's all this physical pain that you didn't even feel before. It's the same process emotionally. Mm -hmm. you, you'll actually go through a period where you become conscious of the pain that you've put yourself through or that others put you through. Yes. Yeah. And that's, the, that's a part of the way of release. And it's also a part of the path to God, unfortunately, when we come from a condition where we've been suppressed. Yes. Yeah. If, if we had all been grown up, if, we've all, if we had all perfect parents who were all at one with God before we came to the earth we wouldn't have to go through all of that. We'd only go through the pain of what we created. But because we've had this multi-generational injuries passed down, by the time we have five, six, seven years of age, we're very suppressed. We've then carried on a life of suppression. We're going to, once we go through this emotional process, we're going to feel it's quite extreme. And it, and it is quite extreme. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and that's the way it, it will be. Thank you. Yeah. And like I've had those emotionally extreme processes. So when I've talked about emotional processing with most people, they have no idea what I'm talking about yet yeah. because they haven't gone through this process that you're mm -hmm. now going through. Now that you're going through this process, this is the kind of process I've been through. Mm, Does that make you. sense? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, it, and it, has, it, is, it is very painful physically, very painful emotionally, and, uh, and yet... If you, if you think about it in terms of time, um, it's not a very large time in terms of the comparison with your life. So the key is a, to continue learning from the experience. So when you feel this pain, understand that that's a denial of a certain emotion. 
So in particular, this pain with your muscular system and the lower, lower back, this is in, in, in particular the denial of the emotional pain associated with why you wanted to withdraw from society, which was all about how bad you feel about yourself, which is all about what your mum has said and done yes. to you in your childhood. That's the pain you're going to now need to let yourself experience, which is going to be emotional, so it's going to be, very, it's going to be a grieving process. When you allow that grieving process to occur, you will have less physical pain. Thank you. When yes. you shut down that grieving process, because you're now conscious, or, uh, consciously aware of the relationship between emotional pain and physical pain, there will be an awareness of the physical pain that results. Yes, yeah, so a couple of, you know, some of the things that happened in childhood, you know, that have come up before, but there's other little things now that are coming up that, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, that I've got memories about and what happened. Yeah. But there are some things that I've got no idea, you know, still no mm -hmm. idea. I'm just crying. Yes, and that's fine because, uh, because a lot of the, the sadness that we develop over our life began in the first two to three years of our life. Yes. And much did. of that we weren't allowed to cry out. In fact, a lot of, you, you know, your own mother used the technique of isolating you whenever you were crying. Yes. Uh, which is basically, basically a form of punishment about you crying. And, uh, and she isolated you for sometimes hours at a time, uh, not responding to any of your needs at all, um, just in order to manage your crying. That's right. And so this is a method that she, she taught you through that process that the only way that you're going to get any attention is by not allowing yourself to cry, by not allowing the process of, of, of sadness. And, and that is going to now have to be unlearned. You're going to have to unlearn that, unfortunately. But in the process of unlearning it, you'll have a lot of freedom come to you mm -hmm. as a result. But understand it's going to be an emotionally painful process and, and, but continue having a desire to do it. Yes. Because well, if I you have, don't do yes. it, you no. carry it around more. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it's great that you're allowing it to happen without too much intellectual you know, mind games that you're playing with yourself there. You, when, you, when the tears coming up, you just allow yourself to cry and you're not worried about what it's about. In fact, you, half the time you don't know what it's about no. and you're not going to know what it's about because you didn't have a developed mind at the time the emotion was suppressed. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. So you're not going to know what some of these emotions are about. You're just going to need to let yourself cry. Thank you. Without, yeah. without judging it and without trying to manage it. And if you do that, you'll find your pain will continue to reduce. And as your pain continues to reduce, then you'll understand more the relationship between the emotional pain and the physical pain. And that will help you a lot in future working your way through things. The key, once you begin this process, Catherine, the key is to allow it to go on as long as possible. Because what I've found personally is that if you shut down it in the early stages of its development, what it does is it has the effect of dragging everything out later and it makes it much, much more difficult later to get to the bottom of other things. So you're best just going with it rather than shutting it down. And uh, what I see happening for a lot of people is they get a little bit of it triggered and then they shut it down and that just drags out this entire process much, much longer. Yes. And it's not good for you if you do that. It's far better... What I did was I allowed it just to happen naturally like for hours and hours a day. So on the average, probably over the period of time when I, from when I began, on the average I would have cried from four to six hours every day. Right. right? And the only people that were stressed out about that were people who heard about it. Because <laughs> mm. I was alone. But if I ever told anybody about it, they'd all get worried about me. But I wasn't worried yes. because I, I trusted that I was going through a process with God that I needed to go through to release. Does that yes. make sense? And because I felt that connection with God more and more strongly as I did the process, I knew that it was the right way to go. And so nobody else would have been able to convince me at that time that it was the wrong way to go. Mm. But, but I, I was happy to be alone yes. because, because if, if you're around other people you when you're doing that... 
they're always trying to shut you down, control you with it, push you around, tell you that something's wrong, you should go and see a doctor and all those kind of things. And you don't need it during no. that phase. Yeah. No, no. I, I realise that, yes. Yeah. You know, I quite often wake up at night and I may cry for two hours, but <laughs> once I start crying, I start praying to God to let me keep crying because... Yeah. It's quite often very difficult to get into this space and, yeah. and I just want to keep, while it's there, I just want to keep crying. Let it out, yeah. Yes, and, and, yeah. and let it go. Yeah. yeah. Now, you should find if you do this consistently for, for a few more months at least, um, you will find that there will be some major changes in your body as a result and this is an indication that things are improving. So the loss of weight, for example, <laughs> which is something you've always wanted to do. Oh, I have been thin at different stages, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. But you've always wanted to do it in the sense of it easily without yes. having to change your diet and all those kind of yes. things. And this will happen automatically as you, as you work your way through different emotions. So, so your body changing is a, is a feedback system. Again, another feedback system that God's giving you that, yeah, think this is the right track now. You know, you're on the right track now. The majority of people who have heard divine truth are not yet on the right track because uh, they're not yet willing to go through this body-based physical process that's very emotional in nature. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much for all that. You're all very right. kind. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah. Have I answered your questions completely, though? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so... The, can I just say one more thing to you, and that is have faith that God has you in his care. Have faith that this process is a natural process. You were drawn through an attraction, the, your own soul attracting a man. It doesn't matter what he believes about emotion or anything. You've attracted a man that's pushed certain buttons in your body yes. that's all of a sudden started the release process to occur. This is wonderful. The key for you is to now trust that God has led you to this process and at some point in the future, once that slows down and stops and you'll you find, oh, I don't need to go to him anymore because he can't trigger any more of what I've got in me. I need to find something else that can, you know. Yes. But, but at the moment, it's something that's helped you immensely, I feel, to start releasing what, what, what has been a huge amount of terror and lack of, uh, lack of uh, self-worth inside of you and... and if you can engage that for as long as you possibly can and trust God through that process, whether you pass or you stay here on earth, it's doesn't going, matter. it doesn't matter. You know the process now. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes. You know it now, so you know what to do. Right? So whether you pass or stay on earth, you know what to do now. The average person on earth doesn't have any idea what to do and they pass not having any idea what to do and they have to work it out sometime in their future in the spirit world. Um, it's far better to do what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. So just have some confidence in God about the process. Have faith in God and remind yourself that during those times you're releasing, if you, if you stay open to God's love, you will also receive some of God's love during that time and you'll feel that and you'll know that you're cared for then and, and you'll, you'll work through the issues quite well. Thank you very much. Yeah. You. You're doing good. Thank you. Even though you feel like you're doing bad. <laughs> <laughs> if we go just behind your feet. Hello. Now, I uh, have an opposite situation, and I, I was happy about it when I first arrived. Now I'm a bit worried. <laughs> <laughs> An opposite situation? Yeah. I will, I will tell you, you just why. hold the mic up Sorry. a bit. Sorry. Um, I've discovered divine truth just about three, three weeks ago. Right. And... Um, and I've been very excited about it. I've watched as many videos as I could, and I'm reading books. And, and uh, it's like I've found what I've been looking for, and I've been very happy about it. Mm -hmm. I feel I've gone from a stage of self-reliance to a stage of God-reliance, which yeah. I, I was craving. So as an opposite, and now I'm wondering if, if it's okay. Now, I had a back problem that had been going on for a long time and it had been consistently going worse. And I've tried acupuncture yeah. and I've tried chiropractor and I've tried all sorts of things and it didn't work. Well, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have, I mean, you know, over, and it's, it's gone sort of gradually and it's really gone, like gone, gone. Yeah. Now, 
now I'm worried. <laughs> <laughs> You're worried that something good's happened. <laughs> well, I'm worried in the sense that you said, you know, things don't happen quickly. That's sort of quick. You know, it's happened in a period of two weeks for me. Um, it's true that I've been very happy about finally sort of connecting with God. I'm so excited. I'm yeah. immensely happy. That's very good. And it's... Um, and, and, and I haven't asked for this to go, but it's gone, right? Yeah. And I'm like, wow, maybe something that I'm, you know, maybe it's good. So now, can you Can I explain me? what's happening then? <laughs> 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 well, firstly, remember everyone, every one of you who've had that first experience of finding God's truth, how did you feel? Yeah, oh, it's wonderful, it's great, it's wonderful. And during that time, you were pretty... Focused on absorbing truth, wasn't it, weren't you? And you didn't have much resistance to truth either, did you, during that phase? Did you notice that? You were like soaking it up, wanting more, wanting to know more constantly. And during that period of time, which is an interesting period of time, there's all sorts of things that can happen quite rapidly. One of the things is that any spirits that are attached to you, who are, who are in a certain way of life or a certain way of existing... As long as you're willing to let go of them through the process of letting go of some of your addictions, um, they will leave you automatically, for example. So sometimes we have physical problems that are attached to spirits who are attached to us. So they affect us. And in the process of going through this beautiful period, which I call the honeymoon period. <laughs> so you're in the honeymoon period. <laughs> honeymoon periods are not all bad. No, 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 no. <laughs> so you're in the honeymoon period. And in the honeymoon period, um, there are a lot of changes that can occur that can occur quite rapidly for a lot of reasons. One reason is that you have, during that period, you have a, usually a deep trust in God for the first time. You have a great openness to hearing more truth for the first time, oftentimes in your life. You also are aware of spirits a little bit more and, and therefore aware of any attachments that might be present and how to release them. Is, 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 a lot of them get released just by you learning new things and therefore giving away the old things that you used to know. I recognise lots of errors. Yep, um, of beliefs. Through the talks, yep. I thought, you know... I, That's correct. So you recognise the errors that you go many, through. Many. And you have some emotional... Release with some of the errors, yeah. right? So this is a great... As soon as you have some emotional releases, of course, with some of the errors, that means that any spirits that are attached to those particular emotional addictions that you may have had get released from you. And so that first period of time is usually quite a lovely time for most people. Did all of you find the case the first time? How many of you found when you first discovered Divine Truth it was just a terrible time for the first few weeks? Nobody. So, so most... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Except Mary, right? Mary, Mary family. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> she, has a, she has additional reasons for it to be a terrible time. It was good and bad. Yeah, good and bad. But for the majority of people, it usually the first few weeks and even the first few months are quite, off, quite frequently are just fascinating. Like you're learning all these new things and... Life seems to be, you, you become aware of a lot of things you weren't aware of before, and it's just a fascinating period of time. But then what happens is that we get to the things that co have caused or been created in us from a very, very young age. And we get to the things that have been created in us right from our childhood on, you know, in the formative years of our childhood, from the ages. From, from the time we were conceived to around seven years of age, during that developmental phase of our life. As a result of that, we have a tendency in that period of time to become bogged down. Initially, we, we have to come face to face with all of our denial. And that often takes many years after that. So what normally happens in terms of a cycle is we get the honeymoon period and then we hit the first layer, layers of our denial. All right. Now, usually the things that uh, we have the most pain internally about, we also have the most denial about. So they're the last things that we actually get to see generally. The very last pain that you deal with will be the biggest one that you have. Does that make sense? 
Because it's from the point of becoming aware, which is what happens after denial, from, from a, the development of awareness, so you've had honeymoon period where absorption of truth, all these things happening, awareness is opening up for the first time many times, and then we have a period where we're in denial of specific things emotionally, then we become aware emotionally that we've got those specific problems. We go through a process or a period of awareness. When we go through the period of awareness, we often are not processing anything. We're just aware that we've got a long list of things to process. Now, many of you have hit that space, right? Where you're aware you've got that to do and this to do and that to do and this to do and that to do. And after a while, the list gets so big that sometimes you think, I don't know if I even want to begin doing any of those things. And you wish you'd never heard of divine truth sometimes during that period of the phase. Once you then get into the phase that Catherine is into, now a lot of that awareness turns into actual processing and working through specific issues. So in other words, there is no process, processing without intense, intense grief and pain? No, that's not true, because already you've already processed some things, right? So, but, but what I'm saying is there's the honeymoon period where the processing is very natural, very easy to engage. Um, it, it triggers certain things in us, but doesn't generally access our primary addictions or primary fears. In other words, we accept all the things that we are not really that frightened about. We accept all of the things that we don't have very heavy addictions on. Now, the reason why it was different for Mary is because right at the beginning, one of her biggest addictions was hit straight away. So it's a very different process for somebody who gets hit like that. But for the general person who's the first time around when it comes to processing through these things, generally there's that honeymoon period, which is quite smooth. Processing is quite easy. If you remember back to that time, many of you would watch a DVD and have a good cry. Or watch something in a DVD and have a realisation and have a bit of a cry about it. It was just sort of quite easy, right? Quite easy to get into something. And you also felt this joy of it as well. A great deal of joy, generally, of absorbing, absorbing all this new truth. But when you start hitting the layers of denial, that's when the whole process bogs down and becomes very difficult. And that's the process that the majority of you have now started to at least get into if you're not yet out of. Does that make sense? This process of bogging down into denial, into your fears. And, and actually, remember, the, there's the layers. There's the addictions that cover your fears. And when your addictions don't get met, there's the anger that's on top of that. And then when the anger is there, many of us don't even want to be angry, so we deny that we're angry. <laughs> so we've got denial of anger, anger, then the addictions, then the fears and then the grief, right? And for the majority of us, that happens quite seamlessly in the honeymoon period with all these little areas, or all the minor areas. But as soon as we have the big areas exposed, now it requires desire, like a very passionate desire to get into some of these things. And for the majority of us, that doesn't develop, and for years sometimes, that won't develop unless we have a really strong desire to work our way through those particular issues. The longer you leave it, the, the longer you leave that period of denial and, and not developing a desire to get into those deeper issues, the more you want to give up. Does that make sense? So you'll have the honeymoon period, then you look back on the honeymoon period and say, yeah, that was probably just an aberration. That was probably just something that happens at the beginning every time I find something new. And it often is what happens at the beginning whenever you find something new. But when you come to dealing with your actual emotions and your actual, the deepest problems and the deepest issues within your soul, that is going to take some fairly strenuous effort on your behalf. Does that make sense? So the key is to allow yourself to have the honeymoon period Enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> but then when you get to the period after that, realise, ah, now, now I'm feeling that denial thing of, so, you know, the, of all the things that are really going to be big things now. And when you get through the last of those big things, you'll be at one with God. 
Oh, no, Mary, Mary one is that? I was just going to add to that. In terms of that area where we hit that denial and that really ugh, things feel heavy, I think uh, some of the biggest things for me, and I'm suggesting possibly for everyone, has been letting go of a concept of myself that I wanted to hold on to. Because often we hit um, facing new truth about ourselves, realising addictions or how much rage or demand or entitlement feelings are inside of us. And there's a lot, there can be a lot of uh, desire to hold on to the version of ourselves that doesn't have any of those things and wanting to and then seeing them and judging them which is really just an avoidance of the fear of dealing with those things in a really real way so something that I often think about um, when I hit more and more denial and or recognizing the denial that because I feel like it's a process until we get to being at one with God where we're realizing oh I've been denying that and we deal with that and then we there's a new layer. Oh, wow, there's this I've been denying as well. And I often think about in those times, this is just another process of me letting go of a concept that I want to hold on to about myself and opening up to God's concept and potential in me. Um, but often I get stuck at the self-judgment and the, the bogged down. So this is something that helped me a lot in those. Because it doesn't have to be as dreadful as when you hit denial and when I hit denial, it's a bit, pretty different uh, picture. And <laughs> that's it's still a very different picture, isn't it? Very different, yeah. very different still. Because obviously any person who's not yet at one with God's in denial of something. Right? So, so right at the moment, I'm in denial of some things. Does that make sense? But my response to the denial um, is very, very different to the average person's. The average person goes through a lot of rebellion and rage and and lack of trust in God. Like a lot of a lot of the average person doesn't trust that in that denial phase often doesn't even trust that God exists anymore during that period of time. Has no trust in the process. No, I don't go through any of those things anymore. I've been through the emotions that cause those things and I've had those experiences and now that those experiences have gone. It's, uh, I don't go through those experiences when I get denial. Mm. Yeah. And this is where the recent stuff that we presented around faith and prayer, I think, and the use of our will in a direction that's positive, mm. that's really helped me a lot when I hit the new level of denial. Still not that pretty, but better. Mm. Mm. You get to the point when you're in denial and other people around you will barely notice that you are. Right, because there's hardly any change in the level of anger or rage coming out of you. There's no change in terms of your general loving attitude towards others. You you've you've you don't blame other people for for you know what you're feeling after that point, and you don't blame God for what you're feeling, and you don't even blame yourself for what you're feeling after that after a point. And so you get to the point where. You realise you're in denial and you just pray a lot about fear and you pray a lot about what you're afraid of and asking God to help you become aware of what you're afraid of. And so you allow that process to occur. And so you don't get enraged with your partner much and you don't, you know, you don't get enraged with other people for what they do or what, you don't get upset with what you attract all the time. None of those things occur after that. But before then, generally it can look pretty messy. Yeah, and often does. Yeah. So enjoy the honeymoon period while it lasts. Yeah. You want to just pass the. Oh, let's go to a guy now, actually. Let's go up to Lincoln. Lincoln. <coughs> um, just going on what you're talking about with, with Catherine, if you're numb to the pain that's in your body, mm -hmm. um, do you then like, hurt yourself? So I seem to hurt myself a lot. Right. Yep. Um, is that just trying to reconnect me to the pain that's in my body, or is that? There's two reasons why a person generally hurts themselves. One is that you go away from your body, and the spirit influences your body under those circumstances. And uh, so we've got we've had many people where 
you know, that work, uh, the work doing labouring type of jobs, for example, in particular, because you notice it a lot when you're working outside or doing labouring types of jobs. Yeah. Um, so I know one carpenter that every time he goes away from his body, within 30 seconds, he's injured himself. And if he's using a saw, that might mean, you know, cutting off the tip of his finger or if he's using, you know, if he's using a power tool of some kind, it gets pretty dangerous in that 30 seconds. And that's because he's afraid. He's afraid of the spirits or the environment that he's in and that causes him to want to get away from the environment and in that period of time um, then he no longer has total control over his own body and, and therefore there's usually an accident that occurs. My father is like that with a lot of things. He has terrible accidents when he gets out of his body. He's fallen off a ruse of shares. He's had hands cut off. Um, he's, had, he's, he's been scalped. He's, been, like he's had all sorts of accidents. It's amazing in some ways that he's still alive. <laughs> And one of my uncles is the same. He, he's had terrible accidents because he goes out of his body frequently due to fear. And as a result, um, he's, he works in a labouring... He works as a tree lopper, can you imagine? And, uh, and huge accidents. Like he's broken his back twice, falling out of trees. He's uh, cut, you know, cut trees down on top of houses and all sorts of things in that space. And... Um, and a lot, so that's one primary reason we go away from ourselves. The second primary reason why we have accidents is because of self-attack and self-blame. So, in other words, we want to create a problem with our body in order to have others or us, have others feel sorry for us and therefore love us or because we want to harm ourselves because we feel that we're unworthy of something in particular. So usually it's one of those two reasons that we have accidents. Both reasons would indicate a fair amount of denial, if you think about it. So both reasons would indicate that we want to... If, if it's the first reason in the, in, in the thing of stepping out of your body and having a spirit, ha, have, a, have spirit influence in that moment, we, the key is what did you want to avoid just before you stepped out of your body? What, what was it? What was the trigger for you to step away from yourself? Oftentimes you're thinking about, you know, your relationship with your partner or you're thinking about, you know, something to do with your future or your past, or, you know, and if you can trace that event back to that point, you'll be well benefited by doing that. You, you'll be well benefited by actually finding out what it is. In the second case, um, there's usually two reasons why we self-attack. One is to get approval from others. So in other words, uh, like for example, I used to get sick every month for one week. It was like clockwork you know, every month for one week because I worked too hard the rest of the time and I felt that the only way that I could get a rest was by being sick. That was the only justification for taking a rest. Yeah, I think I used to do that as well. Yep. Whenever I got sick, it would be something pretty major. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what I found uh, was that I didn't take a rest normally. I was working pretty much all of my waking hours. I'd often be working 120 hours a week. And, uh, and I, I, I felt I couldn't stop. And guilt drove that, a feeling of guilt whenever I stopped, a feeling that I wasn't worthy to stop, basically. I wasn't worthy to care for myself. And so I had to create an excuse to care for myself. And so I'd get sick, and I'd get sick every month. And oftentimes people who are looking for... The, um, a lot of parents don't give approval to children unless they have an accident or are sick. So in other words, a lot of parents never hug their children, never engage their child in any way, unless the child is sick or, or has a, some kind of accident. And if that has happened during our childhood, there's a high likelihood we'll continue that process in our adult life. So in other words, we'll create accidents and sicknesses just to get the approval or acceptance or some kind of love or some kind of compassion from someone around us. So these are the things to look at if you're finding yourself having accidents frequently. By the way, um, many of you have accidents that you're in completely deni denial of as well. Just simple accidents like you know, cutting up the veggies at night and you cut yourself. That happens on a regular basis or burning yourself in the oven whenever you're cooking, or you know, those kind of accidents. Where, 
And many of us are in denial of those kind of accidents. We sort of see them as a fact of life or a way, you know, that are part of our life. We don't see them as something that's actually occurring because of some kind of denial of an emotion. So the key for us is to start seeing everything like that as a connection to some kind of denial of emotion. When you are fully connected in every possible way to every possible thing you're doing, you don't finish up having accidents at all. And you are actually, you become super aware of everything that's going on around you without you having to be, be fear-based aware of it. Does that make sense? So, so you know who's distressed, you know who's not, you know what the driver in front of you is going to do with his car, what the drivers coming towards you are going to do with theirs. You automatically make uh, corrections for, for their actions that they may take that will that will somehow or potentially damage you if, if you weren't aware. You automatically do it. You, you find yourself automatically doing it and then you miss this accident and miss that one. And, miss, you know, and this is how God created you to be, actually, to be very aware of everything that's going on around you and very in tune with your own body, very in tune with your own life, very in tune emotionally and therefore in tune with everything that's happening. And, and that's how God created you to be. So do you want to bring up any examples? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, the last, last accident was um, I had to get some stuff out of the shed mm -hmm. and I didn't have um, my key. So I broke in and I, as I was climbing in, um, I fell and all this stuff fell on me. And um, yeah, a few cuts and... And yep. bruises and a uh, bit, bit dazed and yeah, um, right. yeah sore yeah. Um, for a couple of days after that. So where was the shed, your home shed? Yeah, yeah, at home. And where was the key? Um, had two keys. Yeah. Philippa had one set and she just um, flown off to go and do some work. Yeah. And then um, my other key was with Dave. So a person who was helping you work. Yeah. Yeah. So why was there no set with you? Um, because I gave my key to Dave to do some work yeah. while I was away on holidays and then right. we just hadn't caught up since we'd you, been back. And hadn't gotten it back. Yeah. Yep. Why do you think that happened? Um, you see, there's two issues there. Well, I, I remembered thought. I needed a key just after Philip had got on the plane. So she'd gone on a plane. Yeah, and took her well, keys with her. And took the keys with her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the reason why I ask why is because you've got two things going on. You've got something going on with women, obviously, which would mean that you've given or, or the, the woman hasn't thought of you and what you might need. And you've also got something going on with a fellow workman who, who you've given something with to and not gotten it back from them. And they must have, he, Dave, you must have known that he needed it back at some point, but you would have assumed that he had a second set of keys, I gather. Yeah, well, when, when this actually happened, I thought it exactly straight away because I went away on holidays. I'm like, I should have left the key at his place so when he got back, it would have been there. So I identified that I hadn't considered that straight away. So two people had gone away without considering you. <laughs> All right. How does that feel? Lincoln? How does that feel? <laughs> um, I was going to say normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. It is normal for your life. And, and, and it's very true what you say. It is normal for your life. However, it's not normal from God's perspective. You know that. But it is normal in your life. It is something you attract regularly. So why? Why do you attract it regularly is the key. That's the question, isn't it? You see, if you had a key, you would never gone through the window and had the accident. But if you felt about why you didn't have the key before, before you, you went through the window, the window yeah. you probably wouldn't have had the accident either. Yeah, well, I wasn't going to go in the day that I did, but then I had a fear that if I couldn't get in, I wouldn't get the tools to do the job 
that I needed. So I just wanted to get it done to make sure I could get what I needed and then... Yeah, but it's, it's interesting kind of already in this conversation, you're skipping over the actual cause. The actual cause wasn't the fact that you needed the tools. The actual cause was the fact that two people hadn't thought of you, which is a regular occurrence in your life. And you don't want to feel about the grief of that. In fact, the way you avoid the grief of that is by telling yourself that it's normal. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you tell yourself it's normal, you're avoiding the grief of that. If you had sat outside the shed the very first time you noticed that the shed was all locked and you had no keys and just had a big rant and rave about the fact that nobody cared about you and then got into some grief about it, it's highly likely that either one of them would have thought about the key issue and rang you or talked to you about it or something like that, or, or you would have found a way into the shed that would have meant you're not injuring yourself. And every subsequent event that happened, happened because of the denial of that first emotion. Does that make sense? So often I say to people and, uh, that it's tiny little things. Like Mary often says, you've got to sweat the small stuff. <laughs> because it's often that tiny event that you can trace something back to, that there's actually something major in. So, so you had two people not think of you and what you would need. Right? And you often don't think of yourself and what you would need. And then you had two other people not think of you and what you would need. And as a result, you then took an action that finished up in self-harm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the whole tool thing, need the tool things, and that, that's just the reason you gave yourself for taking the action. But the real reason was because you didn't have the key. And so I would always trace it back to the real reason. I didn't have the key. Why didn't I have the key? Because they didn't give me the keys or they didn't think about giving me the keys. But I thought about giving them the keys when I went somewhere. <laughs> but they haven't given the keys back. And I would have thought about how, you've, how I felt about that. Does make sense? Yeah. So I, I'll give you an example of my own life um, just recently. How's that? Yeah, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> I put in this big watering system at home because, you know, it's been pretty dry up our way. We've had no rain for nearly six months. And, um, and we had all this water in a dam and we've now got this solar pump that uh, myself and Corny next door, we share the solar pump, we share our dam and... And we managed to get all of the stuff together. It's, been t it's took, taken three years to save up the money to do it all. And we eventually put in these pipes and it took quite a number of days, didn't it, Dave, to put all the pipes in together and get the solar pump we're pumping up to some tanks up at the top of the property and get all this lovely setup done. About uh, four weeks after that, I went away. And my workman who on my property cut the pipe that we'd done, and diverted the water to the other place and turned off the mains. Right? And so we, we, and he did it for a number of reasons, but he wasn't thinking clearly. He, he, I've given him many instructions to not do things like that before. And he was obviously under some influence to do it by spirits and others around him who to, do, to do it. And he felt under pressure. He thought it would be a temporary thing. But I came back three weeks later and it was still the same. And of course, no water is going to the house. So we come back and there's no water going to the house, no water going to the outside of the house or anything like that. So what would you do under those circumstances? You'd go, that's normal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did not. I went out and, and got the baseball bat <laughs> and bashed there <laughs> and screamed and <laughs> yelled <laughs> about how annoyed I was about the whole situation. Does that make sense? Just to connect emotionally to how I felt given the fact that I'd given direct instructions not to do that and given, given the fact that we'd set up this beautiful system that was all just dismantled by one action um, and I let myself feel about that emotionally. And eventually I got into the feelings of how much I allow, other, still allow other people to, um, 
to not to consider my welfare, even on my own property. <laughs> and how much you uh, fill the gaps, you, you actually end up doing a lot of work to try and... To fix up what other people's lack of consideration of me. Yeah. Does that make sense? So I'm always fixing up things that where other people had no consideration of me in the first place. Because if, if they had any consideration of me, they wouldn't have done it. Does that make sense? And particularly on my own property. It happens all the time on my own property. We, 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 once, had a, we once had a gathering where 30 people wanted to come and help me green up one of our uh, dam walls, right, by, by digging some sort of swales and planting. And the instructions that I gave them were that I wanted the, these things to hold water and I wanted the plants to be planted in the bottom of them, not in the top of them. I wanted them in the bottom because there's very good drainage. Every single person after I went away dug a hole that didn't hold water and planted the tree in the top of the hole rather than the bottom. Every single person. Now I come back a few months later from a trip, every tree is dead. Every single one. So I had to feel a bit about that. Right? Why did it happen? Because none of them wanted to follow any instructions that I gave whatsoever, even on my own property. So there must be a soul-based thing inside of me that allows that. Does that make sense? There's got to be something inside of me that allows that to occur. There's something inside of them too. But, but there's something inside of me too. Does that make sense? The thing inside of them is quite obvious. They have no consideration for me whatsoever, even if they think they do. <laughs> and, they don't, and they can't follow instructions and they're rebellious. They don't, they don't want to do what somebody asks, even if it's their own property. That, that's all their emotions. But my emotions were, nobody ever does what I ask. Even they, they come and say, AJ, I'm going to help you with this. And, and I go, uh, nowadays I go, I don't know about that, whether I want that or not, you know, because our history has been not a single person who does that has actually ever done what I've asked. And that's got to be something in me because I'm the common person. <laughs> and it is, and it is something in me. There is this soul-based acceptance inside of me that, that, that other people are always going to just run roughshod over what I ask, no matter what that is. And other people are always going to not listen. And other people, and there's that emotion. And I've had, I've had to spend a lot of time working way through these emotions, which are all to do with unworthiness, right? Um, and, but I get triggered on them very regularly. So what you see as a regular event, I see as a soul-based thing that I've attracted that I need to allow myself to experience. And it doesn't mean that the other people don't need correction, because they do. They should have thought of you. And they didn't. Why didn't they? And at some point, you're going to have to have that discussion with them. <laughs> so at some point, I've had to have a discussion with the people who have not listened to what I'm saying. I've had, I've had people come on the property to, to help. And I've paid them, by the way, these, some of these people. I've paid them to help. And I've given them a written list of instructions of what to do, right down, as Mary knows, to a lot of detail. And they still didn't do it. <laughs> they still do the opposite thing. So I'd, I'd instruct them to buy two inch pipe, so they buy one and a half inch pipe. I'd instruct them, and I asked them, Did you know you were buying one and a half inch pipe? Yes. I said, But I asked you to buy two inch pipe. Yes. <laughs> so why didn't you buy two inch pipe? Because I thought one and a half inch would be better. I said, But it's my property and my money, and I'm paying you for your time. Whether you think you know better or not, why didn't you do what I asked? Oh, I just thought I was better. my idea was better. That's how little regard. <laughs> and, and what would you feel under those circumstances? Yeah, pretty angry. Yeah. yeah. So you've you got to let yourself feel these things and also address them. Does that make sense? Yeah, but with... Isn't it my responsibility, though to like provide for myself like I knew I needed a key and I knew Philippa was leaving I knew my key was with Dave and this is where you go intellectually right right yeah it's 
True, it is your responsibility to provide for yourself. But the question here is, you provided for somebody else instead of yourself. And they didn't do the same for you. And that's what you're avoiding. You would have done it for them. You would have thought, I'm going away, I've got their keys still, I need to give them back. <laughs> you would have thought that. But they didn't. And you got to feel about that. Does that make sense? And by using the intellect and the going, yeah, but I need to care for myself and I need it, you're not feeling about that. And it's true, you do need to care for yourself. But if you had cared for yourself, you might not have given them the keys in the first place even. The key is to allow the situation to trigger the emotion that at the time the situation occurred without too much thought to what's really going on and without blaming everybody else. When I say without blaming everybody else, don't ring them up and go, yeah, you did that, you did this to me, yeah, out there, you, rah, 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 you know, and, and really get into them about what they've done. You need to have a discussion with them about what they've done because it's a lack of consideration. But, but to yell and scream at them about what they've done, that wouldn't be very loving, right? Yeah. But you do feel angry about it. You do feel regularly angry about how much people don't consider you. So feel it. You know, get the baseball bat out, get that punching bag out and have a good go at it and just feel those emotions that are present. It'll help connect you with the sadness. And the sadness that's there is nobody really cares about me. Like I think about them, they don't think about me. That's the sadness that's there. That's the sadness that you're avoiding. Does that make sense? Let yourself feel that sadness. Once you feel that sadness and release it, the situation will change. People will automatically care about you. I have sometimes, like, I'll say to Mary, I need to ring such and such up today because they've got something, you know, that I've given them that I need back. I don't even call them. And they call around and drop it off. <laughs> now, that, that, that never happened to me before. <laughs> I've had whole days where I've gone to Mary, you know, today I'd like to do this, that, this, that, see that person, see that person. I'll have to ring them by 10 o'clock. By 9 o'clock in the morning, they've all called me. And I've arranged the whole day. They've, they've called me <laughs> to arrange my day of all the things I wanted. But that only happens after you've dealt with things emotionally at the soul level. So Mary, sometimes you get pretty surprised sometimes, don't you, about what happens in a day if I've dealt with something. Mm. Yeah. It's like just everything is really smooth if I've dealt with something. If I haven't dealt with something, everything's shocking. <laughs> <laughs> we go from one thing to another. <laughs> it's just bad. <laughs> but, but sometimes lately, things, events have just been amazing in terms of even when things go bad. Like, for example, our car recently broke down um, We'd loaned it to the people who were doing all the documentary and who came over from England and they're driving around a car. It's the very last day that they needed the car and it broke down. I go there, have a look at it and the radiator's cracked the, and there's a few other problems with it and I go, yeah, this is like a tow job, bet, you know, and so, so I ring, I'm in the RACQ, so I ring up the RACQ. Five minutes later, he's there. Wheels it on the car takes it to the place, I go around to the place with him um, and, uh, and I, say, I say to him, now it's 40 k's away from my home as well, and I say to them, how, how long do you need a car? They say probably a week, okay, 1500 bucks or 1800 bucks is probably going to be in the end. And they kept it for a week. Now the average person might have thought that was a really bad thing. But you know, if that car had broken down in any other place other than right smack bang in the middle of the town that we go shopping in, you know, we weren't driving, it could have broken down anywhere. It would have been a huge job to get it to the place. And then if it had broken down halfway down to our trip to here, which would have been the next time we used the vehicle, we would have been <laughs> stranded somewhere around Tenerfield with $2,000 worth of repairs to do 
not knowing where to take it and also uh, it taking a week. Um, so I'm really happy it broke down when it broke down. And, and also I had to get home and it was going to have, have mean people coming and travelling to pick me up and everything. And I'd just go in and ask them, oh, you guys wouldn't be able to drop me out. Oh, yeah, we can drop you out. That's no worries at all. So I, not only do I get the car picked up within five minutes and everything else happened, and I was home before. I, I expected to be home uh, like hours later and everyone waiting for me. I was home. You know, they were still all just eating and hadn't even started doing what they were going to have to do. And, and so it all worked pretty smoothly. Now, years ago, what would have happened to me there? If every possible conceivable thing that could have gone wrong would have, would everything would have gone wrong. You know, I would have waited for the tow truck and it wouldn't have been one that day, you know. <laughs> and I, you know, I would have had to come and, you know, put it somewhere. And uh, the, there wouldn't have been just the radiator cracked, it would have been the head warped as well, because I had three, three aluminium heads go on different vehicles <laughs> during that period of time, which meant, you know, major operation every time. That's, the, that's what my life was like before I let go of certain things. Uh, every possible bad thing that could have happened generally did. And I had your attitude to it. Yeah, normal. Yeah, this is normal for me. Yeah, that's the attitude I had to it. Exactly the same. I thought, yeah, this is normal for me. Someone in the universe just doesn't like me very much. Is yeah, I must it? have done something wrong. Yeah, I must have done something wrong in a previous life, as the saying goes. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> the irony of that. <laughs> and, uh, and I would often think that, you know, not that something gone wrong in previous life, but uh, there was something wrong with me that would have caused all these things to go wrong. And, you know, I'd, sometimes I'd get so angry, I'd just, like slam the door of the car. And then not only was the engine faulty, but the window was shattered as well. <laughs> things like that, right? It used to happen. Those kind of things don't happen anymore. But I've had to deal with a lot of emotions in the process. Like in business, if something went wrong, it meant one of my partners would steal everything. Like I, I've, had, I've had business uh, dealings where I was in a partnership with somebody and I came into the office that I, that I rented with all the furniture and all the computers that I bought in the office, walked in Monday morning and it was all gone. And you know where it was? It was four, day, four doors down from me They'd spent the entire weekend moving all of my gear into their office and it took four months of court cases to get it back. They wouldn't give it back. <laughs> Eventually I got it back, four months later. I was without all of my office for four months, like try and run a business without my office for four months because somebody had stolen my office <laughs> and moved it four doors down. That's the kind of people I used to attract. In business. <laughs> and I used to go, something must happen in the free, <laughs> you know. Like <laughs> and I didn't have hardly any emotion, like any emotional feelings about it. The irony was then. That's how much denial I had of my emotions as well. Quite, quite heavy. The key is to allow these things to trigger you, soften to them, let yourself go through the emotion. Once the emotion's released, then you don't have the emotion again, but also you don't attract the same events again. You seem to blame yourself to avoid feeling the emotions, Lincoln. Mm. Seems to be like, well, you've done it like, you identified that you did it, but then you did it again a couple of times since we've just been having the back and forth. So you go, oh, and that's a good way of getting away from other pain, just blame yourself. And then have an accident and then go, well, there, there, that's, that's my fault as well. And instead of, it's not about blaming other people, but instead of just feeling the, the pain that you have. Yeah. yeah. When you blame yourself, you get to avoid the fact that other people are not loving you. And blame of yourself, usually children learn to blame themselves so that they can cope with the pain of the fact that they actually feel like their parents don't care about them. But they actually finish up feeling that they are to blame for their parents not caring about them. They feel there must be something wrong with them. And that's a way... The, that pain, the pain of, pain of blaming yourself, is manageable in comparison to 
the pain that other people don't love you or care about you. Does that make sense? And that's why we revert to self-flame, because it's a more manageable pain than the pain that other people don't care is to feel. So I've been in that place very frequently where I blamed myself, blamed myself for lots and lots of things that have occurred in my life. And I had some really terrible things occur in my life as a result of blaming myself rather than feeling the pain. And once I started feeling the pain, from that point in time, things started to smoothen out in my life. So now, I, as I say, I can just have some feelings about what I want to do tomorrow and it all happens without me even having to call anybody or phone anybody or organise anything. They call me. Yeah. Like a, sometimes now if I'm looking for some, uh, you know, some, some debosia for my ha house or whatever, somebody calls me the next day and tells me, oh, you know, do you know that this guy here has got some debosia for sale? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. It all just happens a lot more smoothly, but it never used to. It used to be a nightmare. Everything used to be a nightmare. It used to be such a nightmare for me that I used to spend days and days and days and days planning just to try and avoid things going wrong, and still they did. You know? Yeah. So feel those feelings, my friend. Thank you. Usually, can I just suggest to many of you that usually the event that you're thinking about wasn't actually the cause of what finished up happening. Usually it's something smaller than the event you're thinking about that then escalated to a larger event and eventually an event that caused the injury, in this case for you. So you climbing through the window was was in the end because you didn't have the keys. It wasn't because you needed the tools. It's just it, the situation increases in, in, and escalates as you deny certain emotions. And so you have an accident crawling through the window because of the first issue. And the first issue is you, did not, you were not considered and you blamed yourself for it. So when I'm blaming myself, I generally hurt myself as a result. Generally, yes. That's what you'll find happens. Remember I said there's only two primary reasons why we hurt ourselves. Remember the comment right at the beginning? Two primary reasons why we hurt ourselves. One is that we step away from ourselves and in that place the spirit comes in place. And So in other words, we're out of our body while we're trying to perform a certain action. And that always occurs from avoidance of an emotion. And the second reason is because we're avoiding some emotion, we want to blame ourselves and that helps us avoid some emotion. So we want to blame ourselves because that means that we're going to be loved or we want to blame ourselves because that means that we're going to avoid not being loved or whatever is the reason. But they are the two primary reasons. One <coughs> is stepping away from yourself, going out of body. The other is blaming yourself for whatever reason. There might be like hundreds of reasons why one person might blame themselves. Yeah. But they're the two primary causes of any accident. Yeah. How many of you ladies cut up the veggies and you find yourself little nicks here and there on their fingers all the time? Yeah, yeah good example. Yeah. Yeah. How many of you guys find when you're working on something... There's always one part that's missing that seems to be the key to get the whole thing finished. Uh, how many of you have found that? <laughs> Gee, that's annoying, isn't it? <laughs> you need to let yourself feel how annoying and frustrating that is. These are all sort of events that are law of attraction events. They're, all, they're, they're the law of attraction in perfect operation to expose a specific emotion within yourself that God's trying to help you in that moment address. It's always, always the case. Yeah. That's the beauty of you. God's laws are just amazing. Every little event's like that. Yeah. So I have a lot, I have, you know, 
We have a lot less frustration, or I have a lot less frustration in my life now, <laughs> sorry <to> say, <laughs> than I used to have. Yeah. And like I said, some days and even weeks are just like everything I think of doing happens just nice and seamlessly. Yeah. The other way to avoid frustration is withdraw from life. I don't really recommend it. <laughs> no. That's probably how I manage that. Avoiding frustration. Just withdraw from doing tasks that challenge me in any way. Yeah. Yeah, myself and Mary had a conversation yesterday and I was talking to her about how she manages to not feel certain things. And one of the techniques that Mary has that I recognised in myself years ago as well was this technique of, of avoiding taking certain actions because you know what the result is probably going to be. So how many of you have, like music? Uh, oh, everyone. Okay. <laughs> How many of you play a musical instrument? Right, so one quarter of the people who liked music. The other three quarters of you, how many of you would like to play a musical instrument? <laughs> You're not being honest, but anyway, <laughs> will that be? So why wouldn't you engage the process of learning one? The only reason why is you already think you know the result. And you think the result's going to be bad. And it's going to be frustrating. And it's going to make you feel like you're an idiot. And it's going to make you feel like you can't do it. And so you don't do it. And what that is, is avoiding a desire. It's avoiding an emotion by avoiding a desire. Does that make sense? We do this all the time. We are experts at it. Many of us have used our whole life to avoid specific things. Many of us have done that. And we do that because we find that it's the only way to avoid the emotion. So, so if you had to engage learning a musical instrument, the first 10 weeks would be very frustrating. right? For the majority of us, we, want, we know what we want to sound like, but we're not sounding like that, right? And, and there's a lot of emotions that are going to come up in that process. And the way we manage those emotions is by completely avoiding doing it at all. And then we get to avoid all those emotions. Yep. And we're experts at that. That's called denial. Okay. I'm going to go to the lake. Does anyone else want to go to the toilet? Yes? Okay, let's just have a break for five minutes or so, shall we, while people go to the toilet?